central Iowa, a farmer's family, and I think a lot of us here can identify that with that. I know I can. Um, then at three, also in the gallery, Professor Reuben Hill, who is a uh, well, former ISU professor, is uh, lecturing on the American family. And then we're ending the week on the lighter side with Dudley Riggs's Brave New Workshop, which is a group that does comedy and satire on uh, the American lifestyle. And that's at eight in Curtis Hall. And uh, I urge everybody to go. It's only a dollar admission. And uh, you can read all the details about those lectures in your, in your little, uh, little red, white, and blue brochure. OK, uh, Professor Charles Dodge is a former resident of Ames, so he's uh, kind of returning. He grew up here. His, uh, he studied music uh, at U of I as an undergraduate, and then received his doctorate from Columbia. He's been uh, composing computer, computer music for uh, over 15 years now, and he's really pretty well known in the field. Uh, he's now director of the Computer and Electronic Music Production Center at Brooklyn College in New York. And I can personally vouch for his being a pretty good composer. I went to his concert Tuesday night, and we heard some really interesting pieces. So uh, please welcome Professor Dutch. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to uh, use a microphone. Hello, Preston. Yes. Uh, so that uh, we should be able to be, so that you should be able to hear without, without any strain. And uh, I uh, thank you for the introduction. It's, um, is that about the right level? Okay, let's, let's try that. Um, I, it's my understanding that this year's uh, institute is dedicated to Edward Allen, uh, whom I see in the uh, front of the audience. And I'm, as, a, as Paul pointed out, as a uh, former resident of Ames, as someone who grew up here, uh, I must say that Edward Allen plays a special part in my uh, memory of uh, Ames. Uh, I think of, uh, I remember Edward Allen as the, uh, as the mathematics professor who, in the, uh, in the heat of the summer, would, uh, in the, and this is keeping in mind the middle 1950s, uh, be seen uh, driving around town on his bicycle. And uh, this was a very unusual sight and was an indication of the man's uh, absolute uh, imperviousness to, um, to outside influence and any kind of any kind of pressure, he he knew what was what was best for him and how he wanted to how he wanted to transport himself and uh, and did so. And I must say that uh, that that sight has always uh, and the, the, the recollection of that sight has always made me think of him as a uh, uh, sort of a uh, a moral a, a moral leader in the in the community and and he was cer certainly was an intellectual leader in the community. Certain and, and continues to be. And I, uh, it was my pleasure uh, a few years ago to read Mr. Allen's book on the history of uh, the civil liberties uh, in the state of Iowa. And uh, I must say, that too was a, was a touching and informative experience. But I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. I, I intend today to talk a, a little bit about the impact of the computer in the arts and to um, Proceed from that, from some generalities about that, to uh, some some more specific uses of computers in the arts, uh, namely in in uh, a few of the pieces of music that I think uh, that I've done that I think use the computer more uh, successfully. Uh, perhaps you're you've been. Uh, uh, curious as to the relation uh, between uh, computer music and national affairs. Uh, I know that the, that question has come, has, has been posed to me in the last couple of days. I was asked at one point if I was going to talk about national affairs or whether I was going to talk about computer music. And I replied uh, that uh, there were those of us who believe that computer music is a very important and vital part of our national affairs. Uh, and and let, me, uh, let me 
try to clarify my, my reasoning for, for, such a, for such a response. Excuse me. Um, my reason were these, that uh, any study of the arts is a study of the intellectual and, and, and moral uh, vitality of a culture. And the, uh, the it, is a, it is then fitting in, this guy, in, uh, in, an invest, in an institute which investigates the uh, state of, uh, of the nation to concentrate a portion of its energy on the state of the arts in the nation. And, and so th this is uh, quite fitting and logical that there should be a, uh, a, a consideration of the uh, computer arts at an Institute on National Affairs. Uh, I can be more specific. The, uh, the arts, uh, especially, and well, and certainly the arts, uh, function as a paradigm for the functioning of society. That a, a careful assessment of the activities in a particular art form can be informative and can be uh, instructive in understanding the, uh, the functionings of some aspect of a society. I think, for example, of the, uh, the great symphony orchestra of the 19th century, which, uh, in which a, um, a given individual is uh, uh, subsumed, uh, the task of a given individual in a, in a symphony orchestra is subsumed to the overall functioning of the unit to produce a single unified effect. And, and uh, symphonic composers of the 19th century went to, went to uh, great lengths to integrate such a diverse uh, group of instruments as the strings and the winds and the brass and the percussion to produce a, a single unified effect. And, uh, and I am, and, and certainly the, the uh, majority of the, of the repertoire for the, for the great symphony orchestra is written in the 19th century. And I can't help but, but make the, uh, the analogy uh, between the functioning of a symphony orchestra and the functioning of a society of that time of the Industrial Revolution, in which you know, the, uh, the individuals working at a in a particular industry or in a particular factory or particular, uh, at a particular task, each contributed to a particular function which enabled the functioning of the, of the whole uh, entity. And uh, so I think in a way our, our um, symphonic literature has to do with the, the, uh, the society in which it was produced. It shows us something about the, uh, the position of an individual in certain functions of that society. Similarly, uh, computer music, a relatively recent development in our, in our culture, is uh, nonetheless an instructive one for our beginning to uh, think about, to, to sort out our feelings about a, um, an important change that's taking place in our society. Uh, one reads in the newspaper uh, that um, before too long, and maybe it's already taking place, the, uh, the, the majority of the workforce, that is the majority of the people who work uh, you know, from nine to five, Will, not, will, will no longer need to go to a central office building in order to perform that function. Uh, they'll be able to stay at home and sit in front of a computer terminal and, and uh, produce the, the, uh, the useful work for their uh, business uh, at home. Uh, whether or not this is at home, none of the, the, uh, the image of an individual uh, no longer a part of a connected uh, functioning large, industri large industrial plant, but rather an individual uh, placed in somewhat an isolation, communicating through a, uh, usually a teletype or some kind of, uh, some other kind of rather remote apparatus with, uh, with the other members uh, of the uh, society, is an image with which I'm sure we all have some problems. Um, it's not the way things have been, it's, and it seems to be the way things are going to be, or at least becoming, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, this, this uh, is a, and, and naturally, when there's an, an abutment, a change in a society like that, people have to sort out their feelings about the change that's taking place. And computer music, I believe, can function as a paradigm for this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, new society that, that we're all beginning to experience. Uh, computer music is uh, a, 
um, is an art form in which an individual can produce the, um, you know, the final product of uh, his or her musical imagination on uh, a tape recording uh, without the assistance of uh, a great number of individuals who uh, function as parts in the uh, apparatus that brings that um, sound or performance to reality. What I'm trying to say is that the, uh, the composer of a piece of computer music not only conceives of the piece, but also uh, produces the, uh, the final product. And, and that final product is then uh, in a form which can be disseminated to an audience. That's a very different situation from the situation of a composer who um, say, conceives of an opera, to take a, an absurd example. Uh, conceives of an opera, finds someone to write the libretto for the opera, the words, you know, the story, uh, finds a, um, th then writes the music for the opera. It's so complicated, I can't even remember the steps. Uh, it finds the, um, writes the music, finds somebody to copy the music. And it's usually not one person to copy the music, but several. Um, then finds an opera company that will produce it, the opera company has to go out and find singers to sing it. They have to go find uh, stage designers to design the, the, the sets. They have to find lighting, you know, people to do the lighting for it. It's an incredible operation uh, involving hundreds of individuals to bring to life uh, the, the musical and dramatic concept of a single individual. Uh, rather, that's, I, I would say, an extreme example. Perhaps a more reasonable example would be the composer of a string quartet who conceives of the, co of the composition, writes the piece, copies the music out uh, by himself, or finds uh, someone to copy the music uh, out, and then presents the, the finished copies to four individuals, highly skilled in, in the performance on a particular instrument, who then rehearse together and finally produce the, uh, the performance of that composition. Uh, that situation is, is a familiar one, but nonetheless involves, as you can see, a number, quite a number of stages and a number of other individuals. Uh, and I'm sure that you can all imagine analogies between functioning in society in small shops, say, and the, uh, and the um, composition of, of uh, pieces of music that involve fewer individuals. And, and I think at that point I, I may have stretched it uh, far enough. Certainly then, computers is, has pervaded all of the aspects of our society. We find them in uh, all of those objects that we, that, that, you know, that are essential to our lives now. You find microprocessors in the, uh, under the hoods of automobiles. You find uh, microprocessors in kitchen appliances completely pervaded all aspects of our, of our lives. And thus, it's uh, appropriate to uh, investigate the um, actual uses of computers in the arts. As to the impact of the computer in the arts, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I uh, quite agree with that, that choice of words. It, it, it carries for me the image of, a, um, of an art form sort of reacting to a blow that has been dealt by some uh, by some development in technology, and I'm not, and that's not my view of it at all. I, I view of the, I view the, the, the impact of the of the computer more as a as a um, an opportunity, a uh, uh, a new tool which an artist can use to produce uh, uh, works of art which uh, audiences and individuals can uh, appreciate and uh, reject or or um, end up uh, very fond of. Uh, in the 19, or in the earlier 1970s, from 1973 to 1975, I was the music coordinator of a festival of the computer arts, an international festival of the computer arts, which was given in New York City. And I had an opportunity at that point to, to uh, uh, broaden my experience with uh, the use of computer in the arts from uh, my career as a composer using computer uh, to, uh, to that of a sort of an art lover. Uh, who could see what was going on. And what I'd like to do is to uh, run down the, uh, 
list of the other computer arts and to say something about uh, the, uh, the use of computers there. Computers, right? well, let me, I'll give you a list of uh, areas in which computers have been used uh, in the arts. Computer graphics, computer film and video, poetry and other literary forms, sculpture, dance, dance notation, architectural design, and music. No, I want to, and, and you might want to, um, something very closely related to the arts are games, and we all know about the use of computers in games by now. The, the, um, if, you, if you walk through Campus Town recently, you'll know that there are uh, these uh, video game parlors where you can go and, uh, and uh, really interact with the computer. Work out your, uh, you know, some of the, your myths and dreams about yourself. Through the, uh, through the medium of uh, <coughs> computer video game. Also, the, something that fascinates me and that I'm, I'm trying to learn more about these days is uh, the uh, computer chess. I don't know if you're, if you're aware that, uh, oh, 10 years ago or more, I know it was the late 1960s, uh, some computer scientists at a conference in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, made a wager with, a, with an international grandmaster uh, by the name of David Levy, to uh, uh, that, uh, within 10 years, uh, they would be able to create a computer program which would defeat Levy in a, in a uh, chess championship. Uh, the 10 years passed, and the, the uh, uh, contest was held in the uh, late 1970s, and uh, David Levy actually rather handily defeated the uh, computer programs that were, uh, that were available. First there, and, and it, was all, it was all handled as a, as a, for, as a you know, regulation chess contest, and they, they had first competitions to uh, see what uh, chess program could defeat all the other chess programs. And then finally, uh, the winner of that contest took on David Levy and, and was defeated. But David Levy has written a couple books about this, and uh, uh, in his first book, it was, he addressed himself to the uh, 1978 contest, and um, he explained that there are, there are, you can be very clever when you're playing against a computer and, uh, and sort of not make the smartest move every now and then and, and, and uh, confuse the, the program, or the, the artificial intelligence that confronts you to, the, uh, to uh, be lulled into making a, a, a similar move and then to uh, deliver a, a vital blow after that. Well, uh, Levy had then... Uh, adapted his, his game of chess, tailored it specifically to the, uh, to the computer in order to win the 500 pounds or whatever the wager was, and, uh, and wrote this, this one book. And in a second book, uh, he, he, uh, about similar, similar situations, he's continued, he continues to play, you know, to challenge computer chess programs. Uh, he um, predicts that the world's uh, chess champion before, I think, the year 1995, will be a computer program. And that's, that's coming from an international grandmaster who, uh, who want to know. Uh, that, I must say, interests me because uh, people wonder about the, um, uh, about the, um, sort of the validity, I suppose, of the importance of using computers in the arts. And, and that seems to me to be another one, that, uh, it's, that computers can be a very effective way of accomplishing some tasks that can be uh, that they can do better than than uh, uh, any other method now available to us. One of the things that that I noticed as music coordinator of the festival is that there were a couple art forms in which the computer was was used a great deal more effectively, I thought, than the others. Um, and I, I guess I, I should probably start with the. Uh, at the bottom of the list, I think the uh, I, and the, the list that I will give is is probably what I'll, I'll start is with the, the list of the art forms in which a computer hasn't been used very effectively, but but the reasons for that are very complex, and I think one shouldn't conclude from the fact that I list poetry say at the bottom of the list uh, that 
Oh, the, the computer is not a suitable medium for the treatment of uh, human literary expression. It may well be that there have been no uh, you know, really interesting writers who have uh, addressed themselves to the problem of programming a computer to make poetry. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. But the case by the mid-1970s was that uh, computer poetry was pretty boring. And it, it took the form of, um, of sort of uh, linguistic trees with um, a random selection of elements among the items on the tree. So that uh, an example of a computer poem would be, or a program for a computer poem would be um, Fred, George, you know, Fred or George or James or, or Jerry. It um, would be one set of choices. Uh, stepped, walked, ambled, ran, would be another set of choices, into, and then uh, <coughs> last set of choices, you know, the railroad station, um, the music building, the campus, or the, or the union, and then uh, there would be a random selection made, and, and uh, the line of the poem would be, you know, Jerry ambled into the union, and, uh, and then there'd be another, another uh, such, uh, such line to follow that. Or uh, similar, similar kinds of techniques were to uh, make random selection among a, among a, without recourse to a linguistic tree and simply to, to randomly draw words out of a pool and to place them in the order in which they were drawn. Not very interesting. But uh, I want you to keep in mind that, that such writers as William Burroughs and John Cage have uh, both made works which are judged to be of, uh, of literary merit by, the, by the, such a simple technique. It turns out they weren't using computers. Uh, I think uh, Burroughs used a technique in, in what was it, the, one of his novels, uh, The Soft Machine, of writing long passages, uh, typing them up, and then using a pair of scissors to uh, isolate uh, phrases and sentences, um, dump the whole resulting mess in a hat, shake it up, and then draw the phrases back. Uh, one at a time, and to uh, and, and to present that uh, succession of phrases as the uh, literary work itself. Uh, John Cage uses uh, more arcane techniques for the um, composition of the words of such of his books as uh, M and uh, I think a year from Monday. <coughs> computer gra com static computer graphics. Um, uh, was another field in which the uh, International Festival of Computer Arts involved itself. And uh, most static computer graphics were, were not so interesting. They tended to be uh, one of two sorts, uh, either random patterns of lines on a, on a piece of paper, or lines which worked out and exemplified a set of mathematical relationships. So pieces which typically resembled uh, sort of fuselages of airplanes uh, in, in model form. Uh, not, not so very interesting. But there was one, one set of, of uh, static images and computer graphics, however, which were a little more interesting by a man named Ken Knowlton at, uh, at the Bell Labs, uh, a scientist, one of the pioneers in computer graphics, who had an artistic as an artistic bent. Uh, and that was the, uh, the technique that, you, that is now quite common of forming images, of uh, forming photographic images out of uh, computer characters. And you've probably all seen t-shirts and, you know, and other things in which an image of, of some figure is made out of, for example, different shadings of the type of that person's name. Um, in, in Knowlton's case, he actually produced quite a, quite a moving uh, piece uh, which was the photograph, well, which was the, um, yes, the photographic image of a, of a third world child um, made out of the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights. It was really quite a, when, when and, and of course, and the shading was all done with the, uh, with the different typefaces, which made, uh, made different, uh, uh, which were used to represent the different shadings of gray in the black and white photograph. Uh, sculpture has, has taken advantage of uh, computer techniques. Uh, the sculptor uh, James Seawright uh, produced a piece 
uh, for the Seattle airport, in which, uh, well, which is, I guess is a big uh, um, extension of, the, uh, of Alexander Calder's idea of having a sculpture which moves. Now, this is an electronic sculpture which has uh, uh, light displays and which displays change according to the uh, changes in the environment which the, the sculpture itself senses. Uh, so that, uh, and I'm not quite sure how it works, but uh, depending on the sound and the light surrounding the sculpture, the light patterns in it do uh, one thing or another. An in a very interesting idea. And uh, Seawright has done other more mechanical sculptures, which I have seen, which, um, uh, which are really very clever and, and, and interesting. Uh, little machines, which, uh, which in, a, in a given area will seek out the light, will seek out a light, you know, They'll sort of come out of hiding and, and run around and try, and try to find a, a light bulb, and try to find a light bulb. When they find it, they turn around and run back where they came from. And uh, 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 some of Seawright's uh, sort of anthropomorphizing like that is, is quite delightful. In the Computer Arts Festival, we even had computer applications in uh, dance. Uh, uh, Joe Penzarone and, and his, his wife, Louise, uh, Made a um, made a suit uh, for for her to wear in the dance, but in in which uh, the um, the position with respect to the vertical was sensed by a, by a whole lot of sensors in the in the suit, and then as she moved, the the, the sensors in the costume changed uh, first changed their orientation and sent signals back to a computer. Unfortunately, at that time, the, the signals went through a, a sort of a computer bus. Uh, off, the, off the back of the dancer, and so it, looked like, it, it made her look like a little too robotic, maybe. But uh, it probably now could be done much the same way that this microphone is in place. But uh, then, on the basis of the position of these switches in the dancer's costume, uh, different events were triggered in a in an, an electronic music apparatus at the side of the stage. So, in a sense, the dance was creating its own accompaniment. In a, in a very, very direct way. Uh, architectural design. Uh, there's an exhibit outside which you can, which you can stop and see. The very general use of computers in architecture and design, and it makes a whole great deal of sense uh, to have a program where uh, you tell the computer the, the dimensions of the, uh, the outside dimensions, the inside dimensions, all sorts of information about the building, and the computer begins to help you uh, to design the, the building itself. Uh, the, the sort of thing that requires a tremendous amount of hand calculating on the part of architects can be done uh, with uh, probably quicker with a with a computer and more uh, more directly. The two areas, though, in which the uh, the, com the computer arts festival was uh, was I, I think most successful, and I, and I don't I, I shouldn't it's not just my opinion. I, I base that on the fact that. Uh, uh, well, th those two areas were music and uh, film slash video. Uh, I base that, uh, that assessment not on my own, admittedly uh, self-interested uh, assessment, but also on the uh, responses from the press and the public that attended the, uh, the Computer Arts Festival. The, uh, the New York Times would send a critic down to the, uh, uh, to the festival uh, to hear what the music was, uh, was doing, uh, because the uh, computer use in music goes back probably, probably further than the computer use in any of the other arts. It's been uh, there, there's a traditional relationship between sort of things that are that are calculatable and, and things that are musical. And uh, the, the, the music department at the time latched on quite early to the, um, to the importance, the significance of the computer usage in music. Similarly, the the Exhibits of computer video and computer film were very well attended and were uh, were accorded reviews. Uh, the um, and and why don't I I'll talk just a little bit about film and video. The two two artists whose work uh, is seen from time to time on uh, the public broadcasting network are Ed Emshuler and Stan Vanderbeek. Uh, one of Emshuler's most recent works. Uh, and is uh, is really quite a fascinating one, and and um, involves an image that could only be produced uh, with the use of a computer. 
Uh, I've only seen it once, and, and that was a while ago. But, but what I have the most uh, striking scene in the film is one in which um, there's, a, there's a screen filled with what may be a, a, a five-sided or, or six-sided solid object in perspective. Um, and, and, and that object is rotating in space. And as it rotates, uh, it's, it becomes evident that, the, that there is a, a film image, a changing image, being projected on a different film image, I guess I should say, five or six film, different ones, being projected on each of the solid faces so that as the object rotates in space, one views a different changing film image on each of the faces. And it's really a, a spectacular uh, visual treat. And that's a, that's a piece that Ed M. Schuller uh, produced the visuals uh, on at the New York Institute of Technology. Stan Vanderbeek worked with the, uh, the artist Kenneth, Kenneth Knowlton, at the, who's, who produced the, uh, the picture that I mentioned of the uh, UN Declaration, using the UN Declaration of Human Rights, at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. And Vanderbeek's work is earlier and uh, appears from time to time on uh, public broadcasting. Uh, in, but now, uh, in music, there's been a, a, a very broad, oh, I should say, before I go on to music, that uh, you, whether you know it or not, you see, you watch computer graphics, uh, computer film, computer video, every time you turn on the television set, practically. If you, um, if you're, if you see the, um, what, the CBS Evening News, uh, there's a picture of the globe that, uh, um, that rotates and has, uh, the appearance of, of lights that go on and off as though they're uh, as though they are monitoring the capitals of the world, all done with computer programs to to make a, a simulated globe. This uh, ABC Monday Night Football has a very elaborate set of computer graphics that uh, that come and go. Um, you see, look, my television watching is restricted to I, uh, I don't, uh, but but it's clear that all of the uh, uh, the, 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 the visuals in television where an object rotates or where an object tra is transformed from one shape gradually into another shape is done with computer programs. And, uh, and this is just a, this has been a, a tremendous development that's taken place relatively rapidly. The, the, uh, and the fact that you now watch uh, the computer and Godfrey and Michael Cringe from also European, uh, and later American composer John Cage and others, is an area which has had a, a great deal of uh, development in the last 25 years. Uh, I was giving a talk in Stockholm in September, in last September, about computer-aided composition, played an example of the work of Legeren Hiller, and I was very pleased when a, when a rather um, annoyed member of the audience said, but look, why go to all that trouble to do a computer? I mean, use a computer when your person can do it just perfectly as, as easily. And uh, that, that, that and clearly the person that, who, who had said this about the answer from the, uh, from the, the Hiller piece had perceived uh, through the, in, the, the, the obverse of the uh, point that I was trying to make, that is that uh, a computer can do what a composer can do. And, uh, and the, the tape that I played was of a, was of a rather, um, I'd say, ordinary passage of instrumental music, but which was uh, nonetheless ordinary enough to be uh, understood as uh, composed in, the, in, in some traditional sense. My experience in using the computers is less Broad than the uh, uh, than the, the computer aided composition uh, field. In fact, I've restricted my efforts in computers and music until pretty recently to the use of the computer as a medium for the synthesis of sound uh, for realizing compositions which could not be realized in, in any other way. I set. Uh, I set targets for, for different compositions, um, set goals which I felt, which I knew, couldn't be realized with instruments, which couldn't be realized with traditional, in quotes, 
uh, electronic music. And I'd like to, uh, in, the, in the time remaining, talk a little bit about the considerations in the compositional use of the, um, of the computer in, in three of these pieces. Uh, I, I should mention that the, uh, that the topic for this year's institute is, is the American spirit, the, the dream, the myth, and the reality. And I think that's a, that's a, a fitting introduction to my experience with computer music. Uh, because a dream, the, the, uh, something that, I, that one hopes for, uh, was in my case for computer music, uh, the hope that I'd be able to uh, make tapes of my pieces without, uh, um, you know, by myself, with, without uh, recourse to large, often unavailable performance resources. I think it came out of my um, finding that uh, it was very difficult to get my works performed. I was unwilling to give up. I wanted to continue writing music, but in order to continue writing music, you have to hear the music you're writing. So in using a computer, I could uh, uh, go to the uh, computer center and with some trouble, but uh, with some trouble, get a tape of the piece that I was, uh, that I was composing. It all started, of course, with a myth uh, that, uh, you know, the popular misconception, which I must say I shared, which was that it would become very easy, that if I used a computer, to, uh, to make my music tea. I, uh, I might have to learn a programming language or two, but after that, I'd be home free. I'd, uh, all of this all the, say, sitting at home and, and concentrating and sweating about what the content of the music would be, it would be over. I'd uh, tell the computer sort of in general terms what I wanted to do. The computer would do it and do it better than I could possibly do it. Um, I was very uh, disappointed when that, that myth was, uh, was dashed. Uh, it didn't work that way at all. Uh, the reality, uh, and it's, of course, always difficult to assess a reality, uh, was that the computer was useful for some things and, and not for others. There were uh, pieces that I tried to realize with the computer that I, that I found were better realized with instruments. And uh, I, telling the difference has been difficult sometimes, but, but, but uh, a necessary exercise because it's a tremendous waste of resources to use a computer for something that, that should be uh, better done with instruments and, and voices. And I found that computer is not a substitute for live performance, but it's simply different. Much effort today is being expended in making computer music instruments to, uh, that can be played like uh, traditional acoustical instruments. Uh, but my efforts have been directed toward radio and phonograph performances, and I've been using systems which are what they call direct digital synthesis systems, which do not operate in what they call real time. I thought what I'd do is uh, I'd illustrate something which, which may have gone by too rapidly the other day, the way in which a, uh, in, in the talk on Tuesday, the way in which a computer can make uh, uh, sound, musical sound, and then get to uh, the, some of the techniques that have been used in, in recent pieces. Uh, here we have uh, a block diagram representing a computer which has been programmed to synthesize sound. Now that program is written not by musicians, but rather by engineers who know how to simulate the operations of uh, sound production and modification hardware of the sort that a composer would find in an electronic music studio. So that uh, the, um, the program resides in the computer and it's, uh, the composer's obligation is simply to uh, give to that program uh, two types of information about the music that uh, he wants to make in order for the computer to produce a tape of that music. And the two types of information, conveniently, are called the score and the orchestra. The score, represented by these lines of numbers, is a numerical coding, or often, of, uh, of musical events. Uh, in this case, uh, we have uh, a, a series of numbers that represent, say, in this column, the, the time at which an event begins, in this column, the duration of that event. In the next uh, column, the uh, pitch, the frequency of that 
of that uh, event. A composition that could be written at home and simply uh, encoded numerically uh, for a computer performance. The other part of the information for the computer is the definition of the, what they call the, the instruments. In fact, the design of the sounds for the composition. Uh, what follows here is a list of uh, instructions, uh, which the uh, music, the sound synthesis program would translate into uh, algorithms which perform the operations, simulate, I should say, the operations of the uh, analogous modules in the electronic music studio. For example, uh, the Oscill would, perform, would simulate the operations of an oscillator. Envelope would simulate the operation of an envelope control unit to prevent a click at the beginning and the end of a note. A, re, a, a statement of uh, a reverberator would simulate the uh, operation of a, a reverberator, a reverberation chamber. Uh, the out would simply uh, route the, uh, the result of those, the results of those operations to the output from the sound synthesis program, which is usually some, uh, well, which is some uh, storage medium such as digital tape or, or a digital disc, a magnetic disc. The operation of the computer program has no necessary relationship to musical time. Our excerpt here, I think, is, is, uh, is coded to last seven seconds. But it might take the computer, depending on the complexity of the instruments and the speed, the native speed of, the, of that machine, say an hour of computer time to produce that short passage. Uh, doesn't matter because the computer program outputs the uh, results of its computations a little bit at a time to the digital tape recorder and stores the, uh, uh, in effect, the waveform and the output of the music in digital form on that tape. When the music synthesis run is completed then, the digital tape is rewound, and then at a high speed, the waveform of the music is passed through this uh, the next module, the digital to analog converter. It's then amplified and, and causes the, loud, the cone of the loudspeaker to vibrate. Uh, in the patterns, we hope that, uh, well certainly in the patterns, the result from the score which we gave in the uh, computer uh, and the instrument which we defined for the computer to play that score. Uh, what is often the case is that when the sound from the loudspeaker is sensed by the computer, it's by the composer, it's necessary to go back over here to change things and to, to retune the, the piece and then to, uh, to go back through the uh, process again in order to realize the intention of the composition. I hope that that's uh, relatively clear. <clears throat> I wanted to talk about, about a piece that, that I played the other night, and, and which I said a little bit about, but, but maybe not enough. Uh, the piece is called Earth's Magnetic Field, and it's in one sense, it's a, it's a mapping of a physical index, an index of the uh, fluctuations in the magnetic field that surround the Earth, into a, a musical pitch scale. And I think I mentioned at that time that there was a, uh, that the um, index could uh, assume one of 28 different values at a given point, and the, um, and that the um, scientists with which I was, was working, uh, with whom I was working, suggested that we use the key of C, and uh, for, other, for reasons that weren't clear to me, uh, to use a, a, a mean tone temperament, and uh, to um, map the, the sound directly, uh, the, rather the scale, directly onto, onto that division of the pitch continuum. We did that. And, and I think I mentioned also on Tuesday night that then my job as, a, as the uh, musician on the project was to orchestrate the, um, the pitch successions in, in computer uh, timbres. 
Uh, but what I, uh, what I neglected to mention is that that was only half the operation. Uh, when I was uh, in, in, the, in this particular piece, the score was given from the simple decision to map the index with time into, uh, into a particular intonation system, a particular scale.